So I have uh, an opportunity. Oh, by the way, I send you everybody's greetings. My daughter Erin sends greetings. Um, she's based in Washington, D.C. these days, so I don't see her as much. Uh, and so I miss her. But I'll be actually, I have another meeting in Washington, D.C. next week, so I'll see her as well. Uh, and so she sends you her greetings. Make sure that you all know that life's been very difficult for her, so if she hasn't been in touch with you, it's not because she's died, it's because she's running quite ragged with all of the new administration, and she's, she was in a temporary position as the boss, and now she, the uh, Trump White House has appointed a boss for her, and so now she's trying to figure out how to help this person l- learn the, the company. So it's, she's been busy. And also, Keith and uh, Jerry, say hi. I see Keith even though he now lives in Florida, uh, I get to see him every once in a while because I get to work in Florida sometimes. So uh, every time I get to go down in that neighborhood, I stay an extra day if I can and see Keith. So we've seen each other uh, half a dozen times since they moved, and uh, he sends you his greetings as well. So please receive them uh, that way. I'd like to share with you something. One of the things, so if, if you don't know me, obviously my accent is not English. And sometimes neither is my attitude. <laughs> I, I try to be nice. <laughs> but it doesn't always work. But one of the, and one of the things that has always fascinated me about being a follower of Jesus is that he has this uncanny ability to say things that are incredibly challenging and incredibly powerful while at the same time being incredibly simple. And whenever he says something like that, it makes me stop and say, what are you talking about? What do you mean? And I would like to read to you one of those places where Jesus says something, quite frankly, uh, which seems contradictory to himself. And I'd like to play in that conversation with you. All right? And so I'm going to read, and, and of course, you know, now that I'm in my 20s, it's even harder to read my Bible. Uh, I think I need a new one. And if I get one, it'll probably be two feet thick because I need the large print now, but what the heck. So please indulge me if I have to act strange, trying to read this passage in John chapter 12. So I want to read the first eight verses of John chapter 12. Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they made him a supper there, and uh, and Martha was serving, but Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Mary, therefore, took a pound of very costly perfume of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped her feet, his feet, with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples who was intending to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to poor? Now he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief and he had the money box and he used to pilfer what was put into it. Jesus therefore said, let her alone in order that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. It's an odd Thing for Jesus to say. I want to recreate, if I could with you, that scene. It's 
Jesus is going to be killed in just a, less than a week. It's the very end of his life. He knows it. His friends, his followers, the people he's been teaching and walking with, living his life with, they've heard him say things like that, but they don't know if it's metaphor, if it's exaggerating a little bit. They, have, they don't really get what is about to happen. They really don't. And they go to the place right outside of Jerusalem, the place where Mary, Martha, and Lazarus lived, a brother and two sisters, where Lazarus died while waiting for Jesus. So he was sick, and Mary and Martha sent news to Jesus, Lazarus, who's a good friend of yours, is really sick, will you come? Jesus gets the message and doesn't respond, which is odd, right? So, I mean, this was, Jesus would respond to centurions and anybody, but he gets a message from his close friend that he's sick, he needs your help, and he says, yeah, we'll wait. No rush. And of course, while they're waiting, Lazarus dies leaving his two sisters with his estate. And the difficulty in that era, which we may not fully understand, is that if you're a female and you're alone, you're kind of in trouble. If you don't have a father or an older brother to take responsibility for you, um, you can't make a living... You, you can't enter into legal contracts. You have no status as far as the law is concerned. You're kind of stuck out there all by yourself. And uh, you're, you're left to the whim, literally, both positively and negatively, of others in your world. And it's a very traumatic and real crisis And Jesus shows up, and you know the whole story about raising Lazarus from the dead. There's that interchange between them, and I know you loved him, and I know you could have helped him, and yet I still know you're, you know, God hears you, and I'm just letting you know I'm I'm keeping my faith even though you let me down, kind of. Which is, I know we can be critical of that, but that's a kind of a nice place to be, right? And then. The Bible recalls Jesus just crying, weeping, more than the traditional official mourning kind of thing. And he calls Lazarus forward and raises him from the dead. And that, again, as his death completely changed Mary and Martha's world, so his resurrection changes their world. And this has never happened before. This has, nobody dies and comes back. It's, it's not normal. Um, and so Jesus does this amazing, it's one of the seven signs of, of uh, Jesus in the, in, in the Gospel of John. And he, showing that, that he, Jesus is in charge of life itself, and Lazarus comes back, and it changes their world. And so Jesus carries on his ministry, and they carry on their lives, and people are coming to believe in Jesus as a result of Lazarus being alive, because everybody knew he was dead. I mean, it's a small town, and he had been dead and buried for four days. It wasn't that nobody knew Everybody knew, and then here he is walking around and doing business with his friends and celebrating, and uh, I would imagine you feel like you have a kind of a new lease on life, literally, right? Um, It does change you, changes your perspective, changes the questions you ask, as you could well imagine. I've had several bouts of cancer where you face the reality that this might be the end 
and just facing that it might be is life-changing. When it actually is, and then you get life back again, I can't imagine that perspective change. Right? Do you measure how much time you have left differently? I know I do after the near experience. What if it was actually experienced? I mean, it's so many things it changes, right? And it changes Mary and Martha's world. Suddenly, um, you get a different perspective. Because Lazarus apparently was a success in economic terms. And, so, and, and as a family, they had worked and they had prepared for the future. And now Mary and Martha were kind of doing the sums and the accounts in their head, right? Well, let's see now. We got the taxes to pay and uh, trying to figure out what they do economically with their futures. How much do we actually have? What are we going to spend it on? If we lease out our fields, how can we be sure we're not going to get robbed because women don't have a standard, a legal place in court? So you could steal, you could commit murder in front of a woman, and as far as the law was concerned, there were no witnesses, right? Because a woman could not give testimony in court. So you could kill somebody in the presence of a hundred women, and nobody saw it because it was only women. So it was not exactly the most congenial environment for females. And being faced with that kind of a future as a single woman was nearly catastrophic. And the localized accounts of the horrible lives of single women who were left widows or orphans. We we experience it even in some of our present day cultures. We, we, uh, my family and the the church I go to cares for about 150 orphans in Uganda. One of the biggest difficulties that we have is that any uncle can come to any female child and take her land away from her and nobody can say anything. Doesn't have to give her diddly squat. We've had cases where some of our girls were Sexually abused by younger men, as far as the police are concerned, nothing happened. It's just a girl. And so it still is that way to even a lesser degree, even today. But it was a horrible world, future for Mary and Martha. But they were wise. They were wise. Mary had saved from the, likely from the harvest of crops you would harvest and trade that in for some kind of money in an agrarian society. The money exchange is very different than in a cash society that we live in today. But they would trade that in and she would, over time, she would save up money for her future. A good thing to do. A good thing to do. A wise thing to do. Proverbs 31 cites the wisdom of a, of a woman who would think like that. So, so she saves up and she spends that cash or that cachet of cash and she would invest it. So she would invest it in precious oils or precious metals. And so she has over the years, saved up enough to buy a pound of ointment, perfume, worth approximately a year's salary of a blue-collar worker. The value, the street value that you could trade this in for would be equivalent to what a working man... Uh, would make in a year. That's a lot of money, right? Now, we could put a dollar amount to it or a pound amount to it or a euro amount to it, but it's what 
a good worker would make for a year. Right? And so she has this saved. This is, this is her retirement. This is how she will protect herself. This is how she will take care of her family, how she will fend off the obvious difficulties that face her with her, her brother gone. And then her brother is given back to her in an amazing miracle. And in the joy of all of that, I suspect, and she can correct me when I get to see her, I suppose, I suspect she completely forgot all about that. Lazarus is here. And life gets lived in this unparalleled joy of it's not like it was looking like. He's here. And all of the economic crisis that you go through when you're struggling to know what the future will hold all disappears because Lazarus is here. That Jesus came into her world and changed it. And so I'm certain that she's just completely abandoned in the joy of the new season. Jesus comes back to town, has a meal, they prepare him supper, and Lazarus is there, and Martha's working in the kitchen, which we now know is sort of Martha's way of expressing love, right? She's a worker, so she goes and she works, and Mary is uh, like just taking the whole thing in. And I, I suspect that as she was standing there seeing Lazarus at the table with Jesus and the crowd buzzing because Lazarus was here and Jesus was here and Jesus was the one who gave him life and the disciples are here and they're all eating and they're laughing and they're talking and they're having great fellowship together and it's really a special moment. I think probably somewhere in that moment she says, wow, has my life changed? Wow! Oh, oh, I got, I, got, I got my investments. I got my perfume. Oh, man, I know what I'll do. And she runs back into the house. I could just see it. Run back in the house, goes to the place in the house where the precious things and investments have been saved. And she grabs that, that bottle of, of perfume. Whatever, 40,000 pounds worth? 50, I don't know what the fee was. A lot of money. Imagine holding 50K in your hand. Right? And you're thinking, so, this is a lot of cheeseburgers, 50,000. <laughs> you can buy. Right? I could get, I could almost get a new Macintosh. <laughs> Just a joke. And she says, oh, Jesus takes care of me. I don't need this. And she walks up to the table. Again, remember, this is the era where men and women don't be together. It's just not right. She walks into the meeting. She comes in with her jar. And she breaks the seal of the jar. And she kneels down and pours a pound. his feet and as it pours as it hits him and the floor and puddles and pools and moves away from him the room fills up with this amazing aroma everybody smells what happened and she's looking at the wet feet of Jesus now and says oh thank you I had to dry them, and there's no towel. So she undoes the, the kerchief around her head, and her hair falls down. And with her hair hanging between her legs as she stands there, so kneels there rather in front of him, she takes her hair, and she wipes his feet with her hair, dries them off. <laughs> And then she sits back up and her hair still dripping, still dripping with the oil. She will smell that gift for months. 
It's not like you wash your hair every day. Right? She will smell that for months. She will put her hair back up. She will put that kerchief around her head. And she will smell the gift. It won't leave her. And the disciples. Now, you know, John points out Judas's critique and the rationale. But let's not let the other guys off the hook quite so easy. The other Gospels tell us quite certainly that all the disciples were upset with it. All right, so Judas had a different agenda, perhaps. He was looking, hey, if it's worth 50K, I put 45 in the till, I take five myself, eh, it's a good trader's fee. The other guys were just as upset. And they say, you know, we could have sold that. We could have put that to some good use. We could have invested that. We could, we could you know how many people 50,000 pounds will feed? You know how much medical care you can get for 50,000 pounds? Do you have any idea what we could do with that? Jesus says, shut up. I love it. If, at least if he was from New Jersey, he would have said it like that. <laughs> and then he says this absolutely horrible thing. You're going to have the poor around long after I'm gone. She did something to get me ready for what God has for me. They still don't get it. I don't think she got it. If she had fully gotten it when they were, when, after Jesus was dead, she wouldn't have brought all the spices to wrap his body in because he still smelled good. Right? He says, leave her alone. And then he says... Wherever the gospels preach, the, you, people are going to remember this story. Why? Isn't, is Jesus cr criticizing giving to the poor? Is he criticizing helping them out? It was clearly part of Jesus' modus operandi. He clearly, in fact, when he later in the evening dismisses Judas to betray him, he says, go do what you have to do. The other disciples assumed that when he dismissed Judas, it was to give money to the poor. That's what Jesus does. He cares for the poor. He gives all the time. It was normal for Jesus to give to the poor. And to the, out of what comes into him, he makes sure others receive. So even when, they, when he dismisses Judas to do what you must do, the disciples are thinking, oh, he's going to go give to the poor. That's what, that's what we do. And then Jesus says, look, there's something, listen carefully, there is something more important than doing good. Now, you know, if you've been around me preaching any length of time, you know that if, in my definition, doing good is a kingdom idea. Doing good refers to the work of the kingdom. It says that Jesus went about doing good. It's a kingdom thing. It's a hugely important thing. It is the heart of the mission of the church on earth is to undo the work of the devil in the world around us. That's what the Bible means when it says do good. But what Jesus is saying here Listen carefully, there's something more important even than that. Because you will never do enough good to erase the ungood. There will always be need. There will always be hunger. There will always be poverty. There will always be abuse. There will always be uh, liars and deceivers. They will always be that. 
And as much as you give yourself by the Spirit of God to undo the works of the evil one, you're never going to get rid of it all. That will only happen at the end. There will come a day when all of that will go away. And in the meantime, you and I are committed as followers of Jesus Christ to invest our lives in standing against the works of darkness and undoing the damage that sin has left in our world. But there's something even more important. We as a church must never lose sight of that. Now, in the early years, listen, in the early years when God began to speak to, to you all and to, to us about the importance of giving ourselves to serve the kingdom in the earth, we talked as if that was the only thing in the block because we were so busy doing anything other than that. We needed to emphasize that the call of God is for us to go into the world and give good where sin abounds. Where sin abounds, grace even more abounds. Bring grace with you. We gave ourselves to that because it was so important. Because most of Christianity, I, I, I can still remember the first time a friend of mine, we were talking about helping these orphans in Uganda. I'm sorry to be so personal, but it just makes the point. And he literally said this to me. He said, why should I feed them and not preach the gospel to them? Because if I feed them and they die, they still go to hell. I said, yeah, you're just going to make sure they get there sooner. Because if they don't eat, they're going to die and go to hell in your world. So why not feed them to give you a chance to get there? Because you ain't going this week. Hello? Because that's what the church feels, felt like for many years. Like, hey, we're just going to preach the gospel. Because if you eat and you don't get saved, you're going to go to hell anyway. Come on. Just like Jesus. So we preach that to you, and we, we focused our attention and your attention on how significant it is, and that is not changing. But on top of that, or alongside that, we have to add or re-add or reintroduce something that is absolutely essential, and that is nothing that we do matters. Nothing that we do matters unless our hearts are poured out on the feet of Jesus. What you have to give, who you are, matters only when you break the seal of it and seemingly frivolously just pour it out on Jesus. But you know what you could do with that? Oh, yeah, you could do a lot. But here's the funny thing. Jesus says, you don't know this, guys. You don't see it yet. But what she is doing is preparing me for what God has for me. We have to realize that God has a purpose for his son in your world. God cares about what Jesus does and what place he has in your world. And he has a purpose to walk out in your world for him. You get to play a part in that if you want. If you want. If you are willing to take what God has put in your life, if you're willing to take that treasure he has given you, and you're willing to break the seal and get down on your knees, and say all that you have brought me through, all that you have taught me, all that I have received, every blessing, every idea, every truth, every friendship, every heartache, every pain, every crushing blow, every defeat, all of it, the good and the bad, has gone to produce the oil of my life. And I'm pouring it out now. I'm not saving it 
for anything else. I am for you alone. And I pour it out. And I wipe your feet with my hair. What makes the church powerful is that whatever God has brought you through, whatever he has taught you, whatever blessing you have encouraged, whatever thing you have learned, whatever truth you have understood, whatever friendship has blessed you and healed you, as well as whatever friendship has hurt you and wounded you, as well as whatever trial has defeated you temporarily, all of your victories, all of your defeats, all of your pain, all of your celebration, all of your losses, all of your gains, all of your, of your times of loneliness, all of the times of celebration and belonging, all of that, all of that, the good, the bad, and everything in between, all of that has gone to make your oil and your aroma. <laughs> you can have a lot of jokes with that. But your aroma is the unique mixing of all of the victories and defeats, the joys, the curses, the pains, the heartaches, the losses, the wins. All of that has blended together to make a uniquely aromatic offering. Will you pour out who you are? Will you pour it out? at the feet of Jesus. Say, I'm not saving it for another day. I'm not waiting. I'm not going to be afraid of what tomorrow will bring me. I'm giving you everything I have right now. I'm giving you all. It's all at your feet. And let the room become filled with the aroma of who you are. Let your world get filled with the aroma of what you know or see. Listen to me. What have you understood that you haven't been taught? What have you seen that you haven't been shown? What have you heard that someone hasn't spoken to you? What have you done that hasn't been anointed? You have no credit. I have no credit. We have no credit. What we have, we have received. So if you have received what you have, the good and the bad, the ups and the downs, the wins and the losses, if you have received that from someone, why not pour it back out? Because there's a purpose going on which you may not yet see. You will, but you may not yet see it. But the only way you get in to the future that God has for us is to give your all, to pour it out, to say, here I am. This is my offering. Life is filled with blessings and heartaches. Fellowship is filled with victories and losses. Worship is filled with times of ecstasy and pleasure and times of kind of tedious. There are friends who bless us. There are friends who wound us. All of that, all of that goes into making your oil. Goes into making you, you. What are you going to do with you? What are you going to do with you? What are you going to do with you? What will you do? You have a pound of amazing oil. What will you do with it? Break the seal. Get on your knees. And pour it out. And say, use me for your purpose. I don't know what it means yet. But use me for your purpose. That's really all I want. I don't need anything else. I want in. I want in.
Will you do that? Will you follow Mary's example? And pour your oil out. I'd like to call you to do that, folks. I know seasons don't change in an afternoon. I get it. Seasons change over time. But God is taking you to a new place. You're not just set on pilgrimage so you can pack up the caravan and go somewhere. You're, you're set for pilgrimage because you've got some place you have to go. And it's still being unfolded to you. It's still being unseen. You still don't know. But the only way you're ever going to find the purpose of God is to pour out your oil on his feet. Whoever you are. I don't care what you're good at or what you stink at. I am more, much more aware of what I am not good at than what I am good at. I really am. I could give you the list of my problems faster than I can give you the list of my strengths. It's not a list. It's like, I think, something, maybe. That's just the way we are as humans. But whatever I am, I'm going to pour it out. I'm going to pour it out. I'm not saving anything for tomorrow. You gave this to me, you'll give me tomorrow too. Will you do that? Are you game? Not a very happy word, but a good word for where we are right now. Let's pray together. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. We are grateful for all that you have brought us through to today. We are grateful for the losses, for the hurts, for the pain. We are grateful for the victories and the success and the blessings. We are grateful that young children can get set free from fear. And that older gentleman can find your blessing in finances. We're grateful for all of that. You have given so much to us. It is a fine oil <clears throat> that fills the air with glory. Please, we choose to pour that out now. We kneel before you and say, with what you have given me, I pour it out in front of you. All of this belongs to you. Receive me. Receive me. Receive me. You are worthy to receive all honor and blessing, and glory, and power. We give it to you. Consume us. Take our hearts. Take our plans. Take our hopes. Take our defeats. Take our losses. Take our pain. Take our victories. Take our friendships. Take our lives. We give them freely to the one who died for us. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.